Welcome to Buckland Station. Uh, Buckland Station, well the Buckland family, they were Fort Churchill's closest neighbor and they were one of the largest landowning families in this region. Samuel Buckland, he arrived in 1858. He was an Ohio native that originally came west with the discovery of gold in California and after seven years of failing to strike it rich, he relocated to what was then Western Utah Territory where he acquired nearly 1,700 acres of land here along the Carson River, and he began ranching, and that was his primary source of income. But he was a very enterprising man, and so figured out all sorts of creative ways to make money while providing service. He had a one-room one cabin on his property that he operated as a boarding house, a trading post, it was a stop for the Pony Express, as well as the Central Overland Stagecoach. Uh, and during his first winter here, he built a toll bridge across the Carson River. It was the area's only toll bridge, and given his ranch's location at the junction of several wagon roads in this area, he was conducting a fair amount of business. And Samuel would eventually meet and marry his wife Eliza in 1860. She was one of those California-bound wagon trains passing through. She was traveling with her younger sister, and Samuel offered the sisters jobs, which they both eagerly accepted. And then just three months later, Samuel and Eliza were married, and they would go on to have eight children together, only three of which actually survived into adulthood. But just over the years, as their family grew, as their wealth and influence grew, so too did the need for a larger home. So by 1869, the U.S. Army had decided Fort Churchill was no longer necessary, so they abandoned the post. And uh, Samuel purchased the adobe buildings that made up Fort Churchill at a government auction. He paid $750 and stripped anything of value off of those structures. Windows, doors, hardware, and this is the home that he built from those materials. Yeah. And so he, his, his actions had two consequences, one of them more positive than the other, but uh, by removing the protective structures like roofs from adobe buildings, he hastened the decay of Fort Churchill. But now that the home is part of the Nevada State Park system, some of those original components of Fort Churchill will be preserved indefinitely through this house here. So, And this is where Samuel and Eliza would spend the last 14 years of their lives. They both died in 1884, and the house would change hands about a dozen times before Nevada State Parks acquired it in 1995. And after a 10-year restoration, it opened as part of Fort Churchill in 2008. So there's the history in a nutshell, a little bit of a foundation. Um, a lot of layers or pieces to, to the area's history. So please take your time and enjoy the house. If you're interested in viewing that video, let me know and I will press play for you. And if there are questions that come up, don't hesitate to ask. Right. Hey, glad thank, you're here. Thank you. You're welcome. We are excited. Okay, let's take a tour. And uh, we're gonna start in here. This is such a cool place with so much history. And this is close to uh, Urington, Nevada. And if you want to pause and read some of those, please do. a very nice drawing. It's pretty cool. Can't see these very well. I'm going to skip this one. There's relics in there. Some wagon chains, stock tether pin, a lot of things, but you can't really see them very well.
That's called McGuffey's Four Electric Reader, published in 1879. That was used in the school that was established here. Look at these old pews. There's a little washboard. And guess what this is? That's a butter churn. That's beautiful. Not, not today, okay? Oh, because, because there's bags upstairs. Bags. Oh, look at this bedroom. This is so cool. Reminds me of my grandma's house. Oh, look at that. They always had such large windows back then. Imagine living here. I know I love this place. There's my daughter in law, Christy. My family actually brought me here for my birthday. Today's my birthday. those little picture thingies, yeah. No, I know what you're talking about because I used to have one. Do you really? Oh, look at that door. I love that door. Look at that neat piano. I just want to go over there and play it. Check out this, guys. This is a sewing cabinet. You know what I think is super neat is imagine these doors being only a dirty wall. I know. Um, yeah, a lot of these doors and windows were taken from the Fort Churchill Adobe buildings for the soldiers. Can you imagine a door like this on an Adobe building? And the windows, is that amazing? Okay, this is the uh, back of the Buckland Station building. This is the back of the house. They do have an upstairs, but we weren't allowed to go upstairs uh, because they are having an issue with bats. So they closed off the upstairs and they said their plan in the fall is to uh, re-roof the building and put in guards to keep the bats out. But for right now, they didn't want any public going up there just for safety reasons. And here's an interesting plaque, the longest ride. In the spring of 1860, in the midst of the Pyramid Lake War, Robert Ponybob Haslam left Friday's station, Lake Tahoe, with the eastbound mail and made his way toward Buckland Station. When Ponybob reached the Carson River 60 miles into his trip, he found that all the horses in the area had been seized for use in the war. He rode 15 miles further to the Buckland Station on the nearly exhausted horse. Johnson Richardson, Pony Bob's relief rider at Buckland Station, refused to ride, fearful of possible attack from the Paiute Indians. This was the only time a Pony Express rider refused to ride, and Richardson was rightfully branded as a coward. 
Within 10 minutes, Pony Bob was again back in the saddle. After passing through Carson Sink, Sand Springs, and Cold Springs, he covered 190 miles and turned the mochilla over to J.G. Kelly at Smith's Creek. After a nine-hour rest, Pony Bob received the westbound mail and began the return trip. The Cold Springs station had been raided, leaving a dead shopkeeper and no horses. He rode an additional 37 miles in the dark before he received a fresh horse at Sand Springs. It has been said that Pony Bob even rode right through the middle of a group of Paiutes heading in the same direction. He finally reached Buckland Station without a mishap and within three and a half hours of the scheduled time. Pony Bob then continued to ride his route back to Friday's station in Lake Tahoe. The 380 mile round trip accomplished in just 36 hours would become the longest ride on record for the Pony Express. So let's continue walking around this house. This really is an amazing house. I would love to live in a place like this and run a restaurant and a bed and breakfast, but this was on the Pony Express trail, but now there's a major road that goes through here. It's a major throughway. And uh, it gets quite noisy. And there is a truck that decided to stop right in front of Buckland Station. So you're not going to be able to hear me talk, but you can see the building. It's three stories, actually. But we can't go upstairs, like I said, because of the bats. So let's walk around the front. This is the porch, and I'm going to see if I can get a better picture. Hold on. And here's the front of the building. It's a really cool building. Here's a trucker stopped to take a picture and they decided to stop and uh, take the little doggy and go in and visit the building too. It was really funny they pulled up right when I came around front to take pictures but this is the front of the building. I love this building. I'm glad I finally stopped. I've actually wanted to see this for a long time. And there's a gate right here into this fenced up area. But I can't get the gate open, so we'll take pictures from here. It looks like they might have, this might be a garden area. Looks like they got raised beds over there. Those are cool raised beds with those little logs and everything. And it looks like they got some plants growing in there. So, this might be like a little community garden, very cool. This looks like it might have been an old chicken coop. Doesn't look like there's any activity over there whatsoever, so it's just uh, one of the remnants left here at Buckland Station. Check this out, guys. I found a bat house. I actually have two of these on my property. I've yet to got in, gotten any bats, but I guess this one has quite a few residents, according to the ranger. But we're not going to go up there and poke at them and cause them to get upset. Okay, here's the sign in front of Buckland Station. And here again, I'm not sure what you're seeing because my phone, you know how it is, it blacks out. When you get it in the sun. So I hope you got that. 